Welcome back to Juice's Arthropods, and we're going to talk about the long-awaited rubber ducky isopod today. So I'm very excited to get started. I am, as always, Juice. I haven't changed. Uh, today, what we want to really go into is just how not only can you keep them alive, how can you keep them healthy, but how can you get them breeding when everyone says it's super impossible. So let's get into it. So what I'm first going to talk about, we're going to go in order here. We're going to talk about protein. We're going to talk about vegetables given, any supplements I would recognize, uh, recommend, any treats, and then some of the things that you absolutely need to have here. So let's go first with protein. Um, these guys take proteins very well. And what I mean by proteins is I typically give mine like the freeze-dried red shrimp that you'll typically in the giant bag that you normally will get for like turtles or whatnot. Um, they take them very well. Just don't overdo it with the protein just because you're going to be adding in a lot of things to the cage. And you just want to make sure because those red shrimp, if they sit there for too long, they begin to mold a little bit. And the next thing you know, you got issues. Um, next, I want to talk about vegetables given. Um, I will typically give every pet I have that will eat vegetables gets organic butternut squash, uh, organic like peas or snap peas apples and other fruits um just again with everything you're giving these guys you just have to keep in mind until you have a healthy colony of them just don't go crazy when you first start working with these guys you know let's say you only have like a five to ten of them they're going to be very very shy but they're also not going to eat a lot so just remember you're feeding an animal the size of a grain of rice maybe a little bit bigger uh don't be just like putting whole damn apples in there it'll be it'll just go to waste at the end of the day now if you have a healthy amount of springtails in your colony you're not gonna have to worry about the mold as much so don't don't feel bad if you just have fruit kind of like getting uh kind of like the millipedes video if it's just kind of starting to break down don't worry about that those guys will go crazy on that stuff so totally reasonable uh but snap peas and butternut squash they seem to absolutely freaking love one more treat I also like to give them. Uh, now, I don't know for a fact if this is going to be uh, true for isopods as it is for, say, lizards. Um, but I do give them some cucumbers occasionally uh, just because I feel personally, you know, when you give them to reptiles, it's really good for hydration, but it's not good in large quantities. So with cucumbers, I will feed them as a treat. Now, some people I know um, have experimented with cucumbers in a large supply and they seem to absolutely love it, but I just typically avoid it just because the cucumber breaks down really easily. It's essentially just water. So it's not gonna hold for as long as like the butternut squash or apples or anything like that. So it really just depends on like how often you're going to be uh, actively looking in on your rubber duckies. Now, for some people, they're checking them out every single day. Don't do that. You're just stressing them out. But I would say every other day, if you're doing that, that should be totally fine. But if you just want to open it up, throw a bunch of food in there, and then come back in like four or five days, as long as the humidity is there, cucumbers and things like that are really good because it's going to allow you to have that moisture no matter what with them. Uh, next thing I want to talk about, and this is if you listen to nothing else I tell you, calcium. Uh, calcium is very, very important for these guys. They were originally found in a Thailand cave. Uh, anything that is in a cave or anything that is chitinous is going to need calcium in any capacity, man. You need calcium as well. So it would just be very bad if they didn't have that calcium to begin with. So one of the biggest things I use in every single one of my cages for anything that will eat it, and it's funny, I just lifted this up and there's like 10 rubber ducky babies right there, um, is cuddle bone. They will just, I just put a giant chunk of cuddle bone in there and I just let them do their thing. At the end of the day, um, you know, like I said, the rapashi will add a little bit of calcium in there, but this cuddle bone, just put it right in there. And if you look, you can see there's just dozens of little marks where they've been eating away at this. I'm going to put this back. Um, I also add just one last thing is I will add just a little bit of greens in there occasionally. I've been testing out different vegetables just to see what they like and what they don't like. Obviously, I'm making sure that all of them are organic. And I'm going to keep driving the organic thing home just because every single thing on the planet that has been created to kill bugs um, is all designed essentially to desiccate them. And that is something that you don't want. Now, some of the poisons are just straight up murder them, but a lot of them are either borax or they have some sort of desiccation poison in them, which means that they eat it and they just dry absolutely up. So what I don't want that to happen. So um, at the end of the day, just make sure you have some sort of cuddle bone in there. And then just make sure that anything that you do throw in there that um, that is going to be vegetable wise is going to be organic. Uh, and last but not least in here is definitely have a lot of leaf litter. Now, if you don't want to breed these guys, 
you know, you don't have to go crazy on the leaf litter. You don't want to have too much food, but at the same time, it's always good to have at least one half of your container just filled with leaf litter. You can see these guys have kind of pumped it out for a little bit now. I think we I haven't refilled it in probably about a month now, um, but they will actively eat the leaf litter, but they will tend to steer more towards the vegetables and the magnolia seed pod than the, uh, the leaf litter. I typically will use either oak leaf litter or magnolia leaf litter. Just kind of depends on what I have and what quantities they seem to do very well on both. They're also really cheap, which makes them, um, you know, very affordable for people to pick up in bulk. You know, I think I pay like maybe three bucks for an organic butternut squash like this big once a week. Uh, and it, it's able to feed a lot of my, uh, a lot of my isopods. Um, next I want to talk about supplemental. Uh, I do use Rapashi morning wood for a lot of my isopods. I just don't do it all the time. The benefit to Rapashi is not only is it gonna provide a little bit of protein, a lot of other supplements, it also does add a little bit of calcium if you look on the back of that. So the benefit to that is, let's say hypothetically, you run out of any kind of calcium, uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about. They are gonna consistently get that, uh, that little bit of calcium in there. And they seem to really love it. Now, the only downside is these particular guys need a pretty damp environment, very humid environment. So the issue that you are going to run into is that the morning wood will begin to mold. But again, if the springtails are there, you're not going to have that problem. Um, but adding it, no, you know, I'd like to sp uh, sprinkle just a little bit on top of the uh, the cork bark at the end of the day, and it seems to uh, immediately go away. So highly recommend that. Uh, one other thing that I want to add, uh, just for like, <laughs> I'm using the word treat here, but it's not really a treat. Magnolia seed pods. These guys go absolutely freaking crazy for. If you put a magnolia seed pod like this in there, what you will find is what I can see right now, probably about 15 of these rubber duckies that are right inside of there. They will fit right inside and they will eat it. I mean, you can see it. It looks like somebody was eating corn. They just destroy it. And, and this has probably taken them, I want to say a good five, six months to get this much done. Um, but they do seem to genuinely like it. You will always find them in there. It's also really good when you only have, say, a colony of 10. You know, in the beginning, it's going to be very hard to find them because of how you're going to set everything up. They're a little skittish when you first get them in, and then there's not too many, you know, not too much quantity in there. So it's a nice way to know that every single time you open up your container, look right to the seed pod, you're definitely going to find some of them in there. So next, I want to talk about ventilation. Ventilation and humidity need to go hand in hand. You can't just have a sauna and then wonder why your bugs that have book lungs or other types of lung situations are dying. Um, it's the same thing that I do with millet feed. So what I do is I take a one inch borer drill. You can buy these at Home Depot or Lowe's or anything like that. It would cost like $12. You need to also buy a drill. If you don't have any of these things, by the way, just punch big holes and put cheesecloth over top. It doesn't matter. Um, you know, in fact, is what I was doing is essentially taking the same kind of um, uh, window mesh, essentially. I would cut it out with an X-Acto blade and I would just duct tape around it. It works just as well, but this is a little bit higher, uh, better quality product that you can get. And it's just a one inch ventilation cap. I don't know what they're for, but places like Ventmasters, if you look online, you can find them and you can buy these little one inch um, pull tab drills. They look like this in the back. So you'll see them. Basically, you drill it in with a one inch borer and then you put these in. I like to put five on top. I like to put two on the sides. Why do I do that? I like to have a lot of ventilation for these guys because there is a lot of humidity. What is that going to do? It's going to mean that I have to give them water a little more often. But I'd prefer that because ultimately I would rather have to every two days come in and check the humidity rather than having too much humidity and then having die off. So this allows me to just have a little bit more control over how the humidity is, uh, check in on them. Now, I said earlier, don't check on them every day. The reason for that is this is especially more so when you only have a couple to begin with. I probably have 50, 60 of them at this point, so they're a little bit less um, timid. While it's adorable when rubber duckies become a duck, them conglobating is not good. They don't like, <laughs> it basically means they're afraid. So I try to do anything I can to not stress them out because of the fact that their brood sizes are so small and fecundity is just not quite like it should be or like it is with other species, uh, species, which we will discuss a little bit later. So I just prefer to have a lot of ventilation, keeping the humidity up there um, on my own where I can just kind of set that path. And then I just check in on one every two days uh, just to make sure that everything that is kind of rotting isn't growing mold on it. I like to make sure that the humidity is there and just make sure any unwanted food that is beginning to mold, I can throw out just because the species is on the more expensive side. 
Now, next, I'm going to talk about humidity. And this, along with the calcium, is one of the most important thing about duckies. If the duckies aren't breeding and or they're dying, there's two things you need to check. It's humidity and ventilation. Those are the two number one things that are going to be killing your rubber duckies, okay? So I'm going to just showcase exactly how I do this. I have a spray bottle. I have this tank, and I'll show some B-roll. Uh, you'll see it. My graphic designer is awesome. Uh, you'll see it probably now. Uh, and essentially, I have one side of the tank, has all the leaf litter, and I take the cork bark, and I put it kind of straddling the middle, but a little bit more on the dry side. And then I have a little bit of moss over here on the, uh, the wet side. Take my water. I just spray, spray, spray. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I just spray, spray, spray on the wet side. And then I just give a quick push like that on the dry side. Why did I do that on the dry side? Well, because these particular guys need it a little bit damp all of the time. So you want to make sure that you're probably spraying it for like one to two seconds on the wet side. Just a quick glaze on the right side. What you never want is the soil to be dry. You want it to be lightly damp. It's kind of like think of like when I mentioned the millipede video right here. If I ever get that to work, um, we want to make sure that you have the soil just a little bit damp. It should just be a little bit clinging to the touch. Kind of like I said in that millipede video, it's very similar to like when you have a plant and you want that plant to have a little bit, you know, you touch the soil to make sure that it's uh, it's got water in there. You want it to be a little bit damp at all times, but you want it to be a little bit more wet on the wet side. What that allows them to do is kind of move into, I'm going to use a word that I'm going to steal from Russ from Aquarimax Pack. So Russ, shout out to you, man. Uh, the hydration station. It's just catchy. I don't know who made it. I don't know if he did or someone else did. It's just, it's nice. I like it. Anyways, you want to have that hydration station over here. You want to have the cork bark just kind of a little bit in between it. I don't move my cork bark where it is. I don't like to have it straddled directly in the middle. Why? because they've been breeding at this spot and I just don't want to mess with these guys just because they are a little bit more particular. So I would say if you were to cut this down the middle, I've got their cork bark just sitting right on that line. So that way they can just peek out, go right over the hydration side, or they can go over that dry side if they choose to. Now, I want to make this abundantly clear. Everything I've just talked about could not apply to you entirely if you don't have the same humidity as I do in my house. I'm in California, more specifically the East Bay area. So my humidity inside my house is like a bare 50 at all the time. It's the most neutral humidity you could ever have. Now, it's always between 75 and at maximum 80 degrees at the height of my house at the same time. So I have the most average perfect temperature you could possibly have for rubber duckies. So when I'm adding a little bit of moisture to this, this is adding it to where they need to be, probably that 60, 70s, 80% humidity mark, okay? If you're in Atlanta, Georgia, don't listen to me. Do <laughs> with what is working for you. It's gonna be completely different because your air is naturally more humid than mine. So I'm just showing you under perfect conditions what it would look like, but the humidity is very important. Like again, though, you do need to have it a little bit dry somewhere so that way they can go out there and they're not just constantly wet. It can just cause problems. So, you know, I typically will never lift up this piece. I will always just have it. And that way it's nice and dry underneath this cork bark, which is nice and rotten for them. Um, you just want to make sure that they have somewhere that they can put their little feet and keep it dry or whatever isopods do, right? Last thing I want to talk about before we move on to whether or not you can use them a bioactive or not is when I started the segment as far as fecundity, I mentioned that you might want to buy them in bulk. I want to make this um, very abundantly clear. These things aren't cheap, so don't do that first. Buy a, so a small sample size if you plan on breeding these like I did, five to 10. I mean, that's going to cost you probably about 200 plus dollars, just so you know. Fine tune it first. After you fine tune it, then you can buy more if you want. But what I don't want anyone to do is go out there after watching my video and say, hey, Juice said I should go buy $5,000 worth of rubber ducky so I can establish a really decent sized colony. That is not what Juice said. Juice said to make sure everything was perfect first. So go out there, get a small batch size, start them breeding, master your craft, then go purchase more if you want to. 
Well, please, by all means, and don't even go on my website and buy all my rubber duckies. Don't do this because what I don't want you to do is just waste a significant amount of money because if everything's not right with these guys, they're not going to breed and they're going to die. Cubaris species is, you know, like I said, very hardy when they're hardy, but when they're not, they die quickly. So now we can move on to the next part. So now let's get into it. What every reptile owner on the planet wants to know, uh, picking on you guys this time, can I use these in bioactive? Yeah, if you're freaking loaded. Like this isn't a good idea to buy for bioactive. They're really, uh, they don't breed fast enough to kind of catch up to the fact that your reptile is gonna just murder them endlessly. They're bright yellow, so they're like kind of can't hide in, in anything. And they don't do well in both arid humidities uh, or an arid environment or a super wet environment. So they're really niche in anything you can use them, uh, use them in. Now, let's assume you ignore me entirely for a moment, okay? If you were to use these for bioactive, and again, disclaimer, you probably shouldn't, uh, you will really want to have more something like a, a gecko cage because it's somewhere in between wet and dry and somewhere between humid and non-humid. You want it to be that perfect mixture. A gecko cage would be perfect. However, geckos are going to eat these guys. So it's just very important that you understand these are not suitable for bioactive. You can do it, but you've got more money than sense if that's the situation you're in. So what if you want to breed them? Okay, now let's talk about this for a second. Are you breeding them to sell them? Or are you breeding them because they're adorable? Both are good answers. However, I just need to address this. If you're breeding these to sell them, you are going to be waiting a very, very long time unless you start with a significant number of them. I started with 10 and actually five. <laughs> with those five, I grew it very quickly to 50 or 60 or more. So that has taken me a minimum of six months. So let's talk about the rubber ducky. Why are they so expensive? Because their brood sizes are terrible. We're talking like five to 10 at most, and you're gonna be waiting at least, I would say it's gonna take you about a month to get your first group of babies if everything is perfect. After that, and I'm just assuming they were breeding prior to you getting them, okay? After that though, you can wait anywhere between 60 and 90 days. I mean, 90 is typically a little bit more on the longer side, but it is a freaking eternity. So if you do plan on breeding these, you're gonna have to spend a significant investment into buying a bunch of these in order to actually start them off on the right path. If you are just having these and you wanna breed them for fun, then just know it's gonna be, you know, you can have a stable, healthy colony. I mean, even if you have a couple die off here or there, they're gonna backfill them. The only thing that you just need to know is it's not like the, uh, the powder blues or anything like that. I mean, you can have two accidental powder blues get into a cage and you got freaking 9 million powder blues now. These guys, it's uh, you're not gonna accidentally breed them. Like they're going to actively breed and you're going to take a really long time. Now the benefit to you though, is if you just like to collect the isopods and you have no intention on selling them, these kind of make them perfect pets because while they are a little bit more expensive, you know, they're self-replicating at the end of the day, which is always beneficial. And it also means, uh, and they, they are, just wanna set this uh, straight, they are relatively hardy as long as everything is going well. Uh, they just die very quickly when it's not. And we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later. But when it comes to fecundity, you're gonna have small brood sizes. Now I've heard people that claim that they've had 20 plus. I uh, I'll I'll when I I'll believe it when I see it at the end of the day. They just tend to not have very high brood sizes. The the man K, if you will. Uh, you'll notice them. Um, relatively i would say almost for me every 60 days i happen to notice them and that's because my you know my colony is at a size now where they're doing pretty well so just you know just know that whether you're buying them to breed or if you're buying them just for fun it's going to take a long time to get any of these babies that you're kind of hoping for so um now if after 90 or 120 days you're not having any babies you're doing something wrong so the first things you need to check on are are they like a weird, like sickly yellow color? They're just kind of a different color than they used to be. Um, that's a good sign that you've got something wrong. Always check ventilation, check your humidity, and then also check their calcium. Do you have calcium supplemental? If they're not in there 
and they're still just like you'll know what i'm talking about like i'll i'll try to show you some pictures of a difference between a healthy one and a non-healthy one and i have some of those i, I bought them from someone else uh, that they just weren't as healthy as mine it's going to be very abundantly clear like a healthy rubber ducky is very vibrantly colored it's they're just they're absolutely beautiful a non-healthy rubber ducky looks like a toy that like the ink ran out of it it's not great um so i'll be able to show you that but just know if those three things aren't perfect these guys won't breed and that's where most breeders actually have an issue is they're just not they're not setting them up for success so just be on the lookout for that at the end of the day so let's talk last about pros and then cons, okay? A uh, huge pro. When they conglobate, they look like a duck face, and that's absolutely freaking adorable, all right? Uh, second pro, they're not picky eaters. They do very, very well. I've got some isopods that if you give them protein or too much vegetables or anything like that, they just don't eat it, and it just kind of ends up being a waste. These guys are like trash, uh, you know, they're like, <laughs> I almost called them trash pandas. They're like raccoons. They'll basically eat everything. Uh, so you don't have to worry about that at all. They're adorable. That's a pro all around. I know it kind of goes in with the first pro, but ultimately, I mean, these guys are expensive, not only because of their fecundity, but these things are hugely popular and everybody who doesn't love a giant, a thing that literally looks like the thing that we're calling them, which is a rubber ducky. Uh, and last is, I would say, the fairly active. You know, once we get past the initial, like, once you get into, like, the 20s on these guys, you're going to be seeing somebody that will conglobate when they're afraid. But for the most part, you can pop the top off and kind of check them out, and uh, they won't really have any issue with you. They're just very active. I see them all the time. Um, if you guys have any kind of, like, glass enclosures or anything like that, you want to be careful how you set it up if you do want to see them just because they're going to stay on the wet side pretty often and then they're going to kind of hide under the cork bark pretty often they don't like to be like out out but they are pretty active at the end of the day i would say if you have a bumblebee millipede they're very um similar in how their activity is up and out at the end of the day cons uh they're expensive man unless you're like freaking elon musk you are not going to be able to afford a bunch of these things i mean i i like I said, I, I started with five of these things. I would not get into them with huge quantities. It's a huge, uh, it's a pro for breeders. It's a con for just the regular Joe. They just, you're, they're too expensive to just have a boatload of them unless you just adamantly love these guys. So that was a huge con. It's just the general cost. And that cost is not going to go down just because the, the gestation period is just way too long and the brood sizes are too slow. Um, I would also say that, you know, as aforementioned, they, they have very high humidity standards for them. So it, it can be a little bit fickle when you're first starting out to get that humidity needs. And it's really not beneficial if you have a little, if like your common isopods you're getting are a lot of like, let's say, um, you know, like Porcelio scaber or anything like those, you know, they're, they're just going to be a very different isopod, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Like the, so the con is just that they do require a little bit of high humidity and they do take a long time to get that breeding going. Um, they do tend to dig deeper substrate. So sometimes, I know I just said you see them a lot, but when you first start out, the con is that you're not gonna see them at all. I would say if you're not getting babies within the first 120 days or so, like I said, check your humidity, ventilation, all those sort of things. Um, but in the beginning, they are, it's like owning a tarantula. It's just like a, a pet box of uh, of wood at the end of the day and uh, soil. Uh, and then last but not least, I would say, you know, sometimes you're just not going to be able to see them at all anyways, just because sometimes it just seems like they have their own personalities and they'll just kind of go and hide places. And I think ultimately the final con is just simply that um, you haven't gotten any yet. You know, I mean, that's a huge con. You can't have all the adorableness of a rubber ducky if you haven't purchased them yet. So uh honestly these guys are great i mean when it comes to isopods if you want something that's a little bit more rare but not crazy rare um is overall just a fantastic little creature to own is freaking cute i, I mean like they're every bit as excitable and and awesome as everybody says they are you can make them in just these amazing containers that you can set up for them and i'm going to show you uh, a lot of b-roll of like what their container set up and things like that look like so you guys can get a more intimate knowledge of what i have set up that has been successful but ultimately at the end of the day is the rubber ducky the perfect uh, isopod no but is it an amazing isopod absolutely i hope this has helped you guys i appreciate it 
And uh, as always, like and subscribe. And I do have rubber duckies available if you would like to own your own. Thank you. Bye-bye.